Okay. So, uh, as you might be aware, uh, we are recording these lectures, and that's for the online section of the class. And I've also sent them an email saying that they can join through the Zoom link that I've shared with them. Uh, so, there may be some questions from them as well in case somebody joins. I don't think anybody will join yet. Okay, so uh, we'll get started with the preliminaries for understanding attack detection and attack response. So, uh, I know many of you are first year graduate students or undergrads who are transitioning into the graduate program. So, you may not be very well aware of some of the terminologies that we use in linear algebra, that we use in uh, mathematics, hypothesis testing, statistics, and so on. Uh, so, what we are going to do over the next 10, 10 to 15 ish lectures, uh, we are going to go over some of the stuff from calculus. We are going to go over optimization. We are going to go over uh, PID controller design and in general, like general controller design principles that people use. And then we'll also talk about probability and statistics. How many of you have taken a formal course in probability and statistics before? Only one? Okay. You've taken a course in probability and statistics in undergrad. Okay, perfect. Uh, so, <coughs> so we'll go over the probability and statistics as well. We'll have like 10, uh, three or four lectures on probability and statistics. Once we understand the entire foundation, then we can start talking about uh, how to design uh, detection as well as response strategy uh, in autonomous systems. So, uh, the first topic I want to cover is vector and norms. So, we usually denote a vector by x. Um, and the, the vector is in Rn, so Rn is uh, n dimensional real numbers, uh, a vector with n dimensional real numbers. So this would be represented as x1, xn. I should probably write a little bit. So that's a vector. If I pick xi here, this is the ith component of the vector. before, do you know what norms is? Okay, so how do we define a norm of a vector? So norm is a function that maps Rn to R such that it satisfies three properties. The first property is norm of x is always greater than or equal to 0. And norm of x equals to 0 if and only if x is 0. The second property of the norm is norm of alpha times x is equal to absolute value of alpha multiplied by norm of x for all alpha in R.
and the third property of the norm is if I add two vectors and take the norm, then it is less than equal to the sum of norms of individual vectors, it's called the triangular inequality. What is the most famous norm that people use on RN? Anyone remember? Yes. It's just plane distance. Like the, the Euclidean distance, right. Uh, so, well, Euclidean distance is a distance metric, it's not a norm. But there is a norm that induces that metric. It's the L2 norm. Okay. So, L2 norm which is xi square. This is the usual norm that all of us have studied, L2 norm. You take the inner product of the vector with itself, take the square root and that gives you the L2 norm. Turns out that there is a generalization of this particular norm. It's called an LP norm. Denoted generally by uh, subscript P. And this is pth root of absolute value of xi is to be. By the way, I should mention here, P lies in 1 and infinity. There are two special cases of this norm. L1 norm. L infinity norm. Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> so how many of you are familiar with L1 and L infinity norm? Have you seen this norm before? No? Okay. So, let's say I have a vector x or let me draw the, the norm. So, let's say I have two points. This is uh, x1 and this is x2. So the difference between them is this vector, 
this is my x1 minus x2 i don't know you can give it a vector notation uh, the l2 norm is the distance from here to here the l1 norm will be the l1 norm of x1 minus x2 will be uh, this plus this that will be my l1 norm because it takes each component takes the absolute value and sums it up so the l1 norm of x1 minus x2 is going to be uh, this plus this if you look at l infinity norm it's the maximum of this or this so one of so in this case this one is the maximum value so that is your l infinity norm so that's how you define uh, different types of norm on rn of course you can come up with other forms of norm as well uh, depending on your problem statement but these are the norms that we will generally be using in the class any question <clears throat> so once again l1 norm of x1 minus x2 is this plus this l infinity norm is maximum of this and this l2 norm is exactly this distance the shortest distance between x1 and x2 okay so let's talk about matrices So matrix will generally be denoted by a capital letter A, which is, so this is the matrix, this is the notation to, this is the way to denote a matrix. So A lies in R n cross M. What that means is, if you look at A, it's A11, A21. A n one one m n m that's how we denote the matrix. So this matrix has n rows and m columns. It has n rows and m columns. Now, when we do matrix multiplication, I am sure all of you must be aware. Let's say uh, I'll, I'll try to do a matrix multiplication. So, A is a matrix R n cross m, x is a vector in Rm. We can do the multiplication A times x and uh, do all of you know how this multiplication is generally done? I hope that is something you remember. I, I just want to do a very quick, small uh, example. So A is 3, 2, 1. 
and 1, 2, 3 and x is, no, maybe I should do some different number, 4, 5, 6 and x is 7, 8. So, a multiplied by x is 3 multiplied by, no, uh, that is correct. I need to have, I need to have another number here. 3 cross 7, 2 cross 8, plus 1 cross 9, 4 cross 7, plus 5 cross 8, plus 6 cross 9. This is how we do matrix multiplication. Now some matrices are special, they are special because they are square matrices. Any questions so far before we proceed? Okay. So a square matrix has the same number of rows and columns. What's so special about square matrices? What's one of the first thing you learn when you study square matrices? Sorry? Invertibility, yes, that's uh, Something you learn before invertibility. Yeah. So you can take determinants. More importantly, you can compute eigenvalues and eigenvectors Easy. of square matrices. So uh, so determinant of A. Uh, the way to compute it is. Uh, do all of you know how to compute determinant of A? I don't want to go through the process if you are familiar already. Have you used it in MATLAB or Python or any of these packages? Perfect. Okay. So we don't have to go through the way of computing determinant of A. But let's look at eigenvalues. So we look at determinant of A minus lambda i. So this gives me a, 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 a polynomial of degree n in lambda and then I solve the polynomial to get the roots. Typically the roots of, the determ uh, of this particular polynomial may or may not be real. You could have complex roots. Uh, but no, no matter what, you will have n roots and those are known as eigenvalues of the, mat uh, eigenvalues of the matrix A. So this will be lambda raised to n plus something um, and then roots of this eigenvalues the roots of the this particular polynomial are eigenvalues of the matrix A. If all the roots of eigenvalues, if all the eigenvalues of A is non-zero, so you don't have any zero eigenvalue, then A is invertible, and the inverse of A satisfies this property, 
that A inverse A is equal to A A inverse, which is equal to the identity matrix. But this only happens if A is invertible, which means that the eigenvalues of A, none of the eigenvalues of A should be zero. Yeah, they can repeat. So identity matrix has eigenvalues one, 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 one. So one identity that you should remember if you multiply two matrices and you take their inverse, then first it's equal to the inverse of the second matrix multiplied by the inverse of the first matrix. Okay. Now within the class of square matrices, there is further subclass of square matrices that are also interesting. Those are known as symmetric matrices. Where A is equal to A transpose. of symmetric matrices. So one full property of symmetric matrices is the eigenvalues are all real numbers. Now, a lot of these things, these facts were covered in your linear algebra class, which is a prerequisite for this class. So I'm sure uh, you should be aware of these things. But I'm, I'm, uh, I'm writing all these facts because we will use it quite often in the course, and I want you to remember these things for the rest of the class, for the rest of the course, actually. Values of symmetric matrices are real. Okay, so it could be negative, it could be positive, um, but they will be real, real numbers. Let's look at uh, an example of a symmetric matrix: two minus one minus one. Let's say three. That's a symmetric matrix. Let's find out what the eigenvalues of this matrix is. So A minus lambda I is 2 minus lambda. I get the determinant. Can someone tell me what the determinant of this matrix is?
what is the determinant of this matrix a minus lambda i Minus, uh, this is 5 plus minus square root 25 minus 20 over 2. So, why is that not a real number? This is 5 plus minus square root of 5 over 2. Right? It's a real number. So, determinant of, sorry, uh, eigenvalues of symmetric matrices are real. But there is something cool about another subclass of the symmetric matrices and that is known as positive definite matrices. How many of you have heard of, heard of this term positive definite matrices? You few? Positive definite matrices have A equals to A transpose and then lambda i is greater than 0 for all i. So all the eigenvalues must be strictly positive. That's called positive definite matrices. Positive definite matrices have this property. I mean, of course, they are by definition they are symmetric, but they have this property that lambda i is strictly positive. Is this a positive definite matrix? Is A a positive definite matrix? Let's look at it. So 5 plus square root of 5 over 2 and 5 minus square root of 5 over 2. So square root of 5 is roughly 2.3. So 5 minus 2.3 is Yeah, 0 0.7, but how much? 2.7. 2.7 divided by 2. So that's also a positive number. So both these eigenvalues are positive numbers. So if this matrix is a positive definite matrix. Okay. The definition of a positive definite matrix is as follows. Let me keep this matrix here. So positive definite matrix A, write it this way, A is positive definite matrix if and only if X transpose Ax is strictly positive for all x in Rn, x not equal to 0. Of course, 
because A also has to be symmetric. Okay, so this is a positive definite matrix, it is symmetric and it will also satisfy this property. It turns out that this property, if this property is satisfied, it automatically implies that lambda is greater than 0. Just take x to be the eigenvector of this matrix. So if x is an eigenvector of this matrix, then x transpose x then Ax will be lambda i of x. So let's let's look at it. Let's say B is an eigenvector of A. Then V transpose A V equals to lambda V transpose V, which is greater than zero. So V transpose V is a positive number. So this implies that lambda must be greater than 0 because V transpose V is positive number. So this statement automatically implies that lambda is strictly greater than 0. So all eigenvalues of positive definite matrix is strictly positive. Any question so far? Okay. Cool. So, if uh, no questions on the matrices, then we'll start talking about functions, continuous functions. a function that maps that takes as input a vector and it outputs another vector. the definition of continuous functions, differentiable function, how many of you have heard of the term differentiable function? No one? Differentiable functions? It's been a while. Okay. Okay. So, let me define some function. So, f of x1, x2 is, I just need a function log of x1 plus x2 square plus 3x1 x2. Okay, so I have defined a function. This function is actually composed of, so this x1, x2 is basically a vector. So I can, I might as well write it in the form of a vector. And I get this function of a vector, which is basically this function. Each of this is a differentiable function. Okay. Now, something that you might not have done so far, so it's probably a new stuff, new new thing here. Uh, we want to differentiate this function with respect to these two variables. Okay. So earlier you might have studied a function from R to R, and you might have differentiated the function, which is a function of one variable. Now I am trying to differentiate here a function of two variables. Okay, 
So how do we make the different? How do we define the differentiation? Right. So it is partial differentiation. Correct. So the way we define it is this is the notation. So I'm taking the derivative of f with respect to x, and I'm going to evaluate it at. I might have to give it a different notation. X bar. Okay. So the way to define it is. I do the partial differentiation with respect to x1 and I evaluate it at x bar and then I do partial differentiation with respect to x2 and I evaluate it at x bar. Now what happens in a partial differentiation when I am differentiating with respect to x1? I am treating x2 as a constant. When I'm differentiating with respect to x2, I'm treating x1 as a constant. So let's try to differentiate this particular function. Who wants to help me? What's the first term? One by x. One by x. Plus zero plus two x. Perfect. Zero plus two x two plus three x one. And I'm going to evaluate this. The other cool thing that you will notice here, when you take the gradient of functions of multiple variables, the gradient itself is mapping a two-dimensional vector to a two-dimensional vector. Okay, so when you take the derivative of a function, the output, the function that maps to a real number, the output has the same dimension as the input vector. Now let's look at so this this one everybody understands this no questions here now let's try to do the differentiation of function which looks something like that so I have f of x but it maps to a vector value uh, it's a vector valued function so it maps to I have m different functions. So the first element that it maps to is f1 of x. The second element is f2 of x. The last element is fm of x. This is m dimensional. Remember, this function maps r into rm. Okay, so this is an m dimensional object. Now, how do we take the derivative of this particular function? What's the convention? So here is the convention for the, taking the derivative in this particular function. We stack the derivatives of individual functions as columns of a of a matrix, and this matrix is R n cross m dimensional matrix. <clears throat> okay. Any questions on this? So this is the convention. This is how we define 
Now different books may have different conventions. So for this class, this is the convention we will be using throughout this class, which is when we take the derivative of a function that maps to an m-dimensional object, we look at the derivative with respect to the individual functions. We stack them as columns. Now we have m columns and we have n rows. Remember, each of these is an n-dimensional vector. So this is an n-dimensional vector, this is an n-dimensional vector and so on. So we have stacked all of these as columns. So now we have n rows and m columns in this particular vector, in this particular matrix. And then we will evaluate this whole matrix at x bar. And that's how we get the derivative of the function at x bar. Now, once you have noted it down, I want you to figure out what the second derivative of this function is going to be. So now, this is your function. You want to take the derivative of this particular function. What's the derivative of that function? Let's call, uh, so this is my new function. Let me call it g of x. 1 by x1 plus 3x2, 2x2 plus 3x1. So this is my new function. It maps two-dimensional vector to two-dimensional vector. So the derivative of it is going to be a 2 cross 2 matrix. I want you to compute that 2 cross 2 matrix and tell me what that matrix looks like. So this is my function 1, this is my function 2. So the dimension is like 2 by 1 right now. This is 2 by 1, yes. So my output will also be having 2 by 1, right? You said 2 by 2. No, no, no. So remember this is m, right? So this is a function that takes two dimensional input and produces two dimensional output. So the derivative of this will have two rows and two columns. But my input doesn't have two, 2 by 2, right? It's like Input is 2 by 1, output is 2 by 1 also. Yeah, but you said 2 by 2. 2 by 2 matrix. Okay. So n, n is 2, m is 2. So this is 2 cross 2 matrix. So the derivative of g of x will be a 2 by 2. It will be a 2 by 2 matrix. It will be a square matrix. Okay, so let's try to compute this. I'm going to erase this side. What's the, I, I don't want to say equal to here. Uh, maybe I'll have to erase the whole thing. No, I can actually, no, I don't want to erase that side either. Okay, I'll just erase this side. And I'll write it okay. So now I need to figure out what is the gradient of G of X. So in the first column, I have to differentiate the first row, okay. So what's the derivative of the first row? It's minus 1 over x1 square. Zero. zero. What's the second? Two. It's just 3. No. I need to differentiate the first function with respect to x2. Okay. So that's 3 here. And now I need to differentiate this function with respect to x1 and then with respect to x2. So I have 3 here and I have 2 here. And this actually is the second derivative of f, this f. Let me call this f tilde. 
this is the second derivative of f tilde with respect to x. When you mentioned previously the output will also have the same dimensions as your input, mm -hmm. how does this apply? No, I said that for when n equals to 1, then it maps to a scalar. This one was mapping to a scalar, so the output dimension is the same as the input dimension. But when it's non scalar, then it becomes a matrix, m cross n matrix. From any dimension to scalar, right? Any dimension to scalar, then you have a one dimensional vector. Okay? Any cool property you notice about this particular matrix? It's the second derivative of the function f that we have noted there. That function maps two dimensional input to a one dimensional output. I took the first derivative and then I took the second derivative. I get a two cross two matrix. Okay. Uh, What's what's a cool feature there? Yes, symmetric. it's symmetric, right? So it is symmetric. Uh, these are diagonal elements, so I don't care. But this non-diagonal elements, they are the same here. So it's a symmetric matrix. So the second derivative of a function that maps n-dimensional object to one-dimensional scalar. It actually the second derivative is always a symmetric matrix. It will always be a symmetric matrix. What about the eigenvalues of this matrix? What would the eigenvalue of this matrix be? I mean, maybe, uh, maybe that question is not uh, well posed. Uh, do you think that the eigenvalues are going to be positive or negative? Or both? Could be both. I think it's not clear uh, based on this information. It's probably going to be both, maybe some positive. Sometimes it will be positive, sometimes it will be negative. So in fact, it's a symmetric matrix, but it need not necessarily be positive definite. There are special class of functions where if you take the second derivative, they are positive definite. Those functions are known as convex functions. Okay, so we'll talk about convex functions in a bit. But uh, at this point of time, I want to stop for any questions before we proceed further. No questions. Okay, so let's talk about Taylor series. So I know that this is something you might recall from your calculus class. So f is a function from r to r. And so you can say f of x equal to f of x naught plus df over dx. This is evaluated at x naught times x minus x naught plus 1 over 2 factorial higher order term. Have you seen this before? This is Taylor series expansion. 
So I look at the function at a specific point x naught. I want to determine what the value of the function at a point x is going to be. So we take the derivative of f with respect to x at x naught multiplied by x minus x naught. Then I add the second derivative multiplied by x minus x naught square. And there is some term 1 over 2 factorial uh, that we need to multiply it to and so on and so forth. It's a very long, like it's an infinite sequence uh, of terms that appears here. And this is known as Taylor series. So same way, the Taylor series can also be done for functions uh, over multiple uh, variables. So f is a function from Rn to R. Note that I'm not using Rm here, I'm using R here, so it's mapping to a scalar. Uh, it's not that Taylor series doesn't hold for Rm, but the expressions are far more complicated, which we don't want to get into in this class. It's not, it's not part of this course. So I'm not getting into more complicated expressions. But when it maps from Rn to R, then the Taylor series is pretty similar, but I want you to notice some differences. Okay, so this is what's the difference between this expression, which is for uh, functions of one variable, with this expression, which is functions of multiple variables. Wherever you see this multiplication, it actually converts into some matrix multiplication. So this is a transpose, so vector transpose a vector. This is a vector transpose a matrix, a square matrix transpose a vector with 1 over 2 factorial. And there will be again higher order terms here, which we won't, we don't want to get into. But you could have an infinite number of terms here, where you have higher order differentiation of f, higher number of vectors that you have to multiply with that matrix or multi-dimensional matrices, and then you get the Taylor series expansion for functions of multiple variables. Okay. Um, many a times. During the course, when we want to approximate a function, we instead of looking at the full function, which might be very complicated, we look at this approximation of the function. Okay, and the approximation of the function will be much simpler. As you can see, there is vector transpose x minus x naught, and then there is a quadratic term in x uh, that appears here. So. You can always approximate, in many cases, you can always approximate a function. Well, uh, not in many cases, but uh, if you massage the problem very well, you can always approximate the function by the second order Taylor series, ignore the rest of the terms, and try to go ahead with the rest of your uh, control design process or optimization process or uh, designing algorithms for detection or response. So that's why this particular Taylor series is important. In the next class, I'm going to talk about convex sets, convex functions, and then we'll start uh, going deeper into control design process, and then we'll talk about optimization, and then we'll talk about probability and statistics. So with that, uh, I end my lecture here, and uh, I'll take any questions, and I'm going to turn off the video recording.